Now, before we hear from our modern day speakers, I'm delighted to say that two giants of Canada's formative youth have agreed to step out of the pages of history for a few moments and to chat with us about their thoughts on what it takes to lead our great country and why it is a task worth taking on. I've asked Sir John A. Macdonald and Sir Wilfrid Laurier in their marks tonight. remarks tonight to draw on some of their most famous speeches, remarks, and interviews from the time when they were still towering figures in the political affairs of our young dominion. And I'm going to start with Sir John A. McDonald. Here, here. Uh, Sir John, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome back today Sir John A. McDonald, the man who made the camp. You're welcome. We, we got a very young Sir John A., I might say. Uh, the best is yet to come. We are all very grateful to you for being the man who made Canada, of course, but it may strike you that, well, this place has had more than its share of trouble. Do you expect to go through your life without troubles? If you do, you have been deceived. Troubles come as naturally to man as sparks rise upward from a fire. Well, that's fair enough, Sir John, but in your day, the Americans and the French, for example, had a lot to say about these newfangled notions like abstract rights as a way to solve our troubles. What made you think that the ancient British system was the way to go? In all countries, the rights of the majority take care of themselves, but it is only in countries like England, enjoying constitutional liberty, safe from the tyranny of a single despot, or from unbridled democracy that the rights of minorities are regarded. Now you're obviously quite proud of your British heritage. A British subject I was born, a British subject I will die. Here, here. Here, here indeed. But what about Canada? For a century and a half, this country has grown and flourished under the aegis of the British crown. We enjoy the blessings of civilization, forming one of the most law-abiding peoples under broad folds of the Union Jack and of the Crown. We enjoy ample liberty to govern ourselves as we please. Let us be proud and show ourselves worthy of this centuries-old tradition. Here, 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 here. Now this talk, this talk, Sir John, of Britain and the Empire is all fine and good maybe for white Anglo-Saxon males, but what about ethnic and cultural minorities? What about Quebecers? Well, we have a constitution now under which all British subjects have a position of absolute equality, having equal rights of all kinds, of language, of religion, of place, of person. There is no paramount race in this country. We are all British subjects, and those of us who are not English are still British subjects on that account. Here, here, here. <laughs> <laughs> you were always a bigger fan, Sir John, of Britain than the United States. How do you feel about a Conservative Prime Minister a uh, century or so after your time negotiating free trade with the Americans when you are famous for a protectionist national policy? A national policy will help prevent this country from being made a sacrifice market and will tend to greatly to procure, eventually, a reciprocity of trade. <laughs> it is only by closing our doors and cutting them out of our market that they will open theirs to us. And so your policy was ultimately successful. I guess you know that in the years since your last electoral victory, Canada has become a much more modern place. Hmm. It, you know, in the 1940s, for example, your own party even changed its name to the Progressive Conservative. Anyone desirous of becoming a Progressive Conservative should follow me. Oh, now I'll bet that most of the people in this room don't know that you said that in 1855. They do now. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> At least one person on the platform who already knew. Yet people say, you, people say that you were no visionary, just an opportunist who happened to make a nation along the way. 
I am satisfied to confine myself to practical things, to securing those practical measures that this country actually wants. I am satisfied not to have a reputation for indulging in imaginary schemes or for harboring visionary ideas. Well, one practical thing that you certainly did manage and that we're still struggling with today is making Quebec a vital part of your project to build a Canadian nation. Well, I said that a long time ago. No man! <laughs> we have it now, we have it now. Another drink, Sir John? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but perhaps I'll wait. No man in his senses can suppose that this country for a century on can be governed by an unfrenchified, a totally unfrenchified government. Treat them as a nation and they will respond as a free people usually do, generously. Call them a faction and they become factious. Now, to change topics for a minute, Sir John, you, uh, uh, it's, it's nice to have friends, but Weren't some people uneasy about the way you use the powers and the perks of government to, um, how can I put this diplomatically, uh, reward loyalty? Perhaps. But in the distribution of governmental patronage, we carry out the true constitutional principle. Whenever an office is empty, it belongs to the party supporting the government. If that party has someone within it competent to perform it, responsible government can be carried on on no other principle. But didn't that sometimes result in a cabinet full of hacks? Give me better wood, I'll give you a better cabinet. <laughs> now that sort of attitude got you branded an opportunity. But the opposition even once accused you of stealing their brains. Ah, ah, I have been accused of many things in my life, but this is the first time I have been charged with petty larceny. <laughs> so tell us honestly, tell us honestly, Sir John, what do you think of Sir Wilfrid Laurier? Uh, who we consider today the other great early Prime Minister of Canada. Nice chap, that. <laughs> Thank you, Sir John. Thank you.